Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome into X's and O's. It is Tuesday, May 25th, a milestone episode, episode number 10, and a very special guest. In fact, he's our second guest from Sportsnet, Jeff Merrick. Whoa, 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 whoa. Keels, who was first? I wasn't your first choice. Yeah, Ooh, well, well, you know, the brotherly, the brotherly connection Colby, to precedent. Seriously? Yes. In aren't fact, you, hang on, hang on. <laughs> aren't, aren't you sick of like hearing from the Armstrongs at this point? Like what, what, what more are they going to add to your life, Keels? How are they going to make what? your life better? I don't think you can ever have enough Armstrongs in your life. I think, uh, I think we've learned that over the last, or I've learned that over the last yeah. couple of years. Okay, so you've already had you've already <laughs> had on Colby Armstrong, the only hockey player I know who can smoke a cigarette in the shower. Well done, uh, Colbs. And now somehow that got out. left out when we had him on. That wasn't uh, <laughs> that was I don't know how. <laughs> he always told me that was one of the best chirps that he ever heard from someone. Like Armstrong, your nose. What can you smoke a cigarette in the shower? <laughs> Pretty creative one, I got to admit. <laughs> that that is that is. Uh, but Jeff, I would yeah, appreciate man. you representing the Mariners with the dry fit there. Uh, yeah. We just need to see that a little bit more on Sportsnet. Do you want to know the story behind this? Yes. Am I allowed to tell it, Riles? Yeah, I guess for it's not sure. going to get you in trouble. It's going to get me in trouble. So <laughs> Riley and I have a tradition. And by the way, anyone out there, if you think you can bribe me with dry fits, you're 100% correct. So <laughs> yes. Riley, Riley and I have a tradition. Whenever he's in town and comes to the studio... Uh, I let him steal a couple of my ties because I got like this this tie rack that's and we have, we have you've seen TV dressing rooms before like a lot of suits and some of them I'll, I'm never wearing they're ten years old and uh, I'm just not gonna wear them for style or fit or whatever and a lot of ties too uh, that I'll never wear again and so Riles I'm like bud fill your boots you need ties grab ties and I said just promise me one thing. One thing, all I like, I have this. Ask your brother, Riles. Like, when we went to Red Deer for Memorial Cup, like, the first thing we went to the Red Deer room, I'm like, okay, I got to talk to the trainer because I got to get a Rebel Stry fit. And so, like, it's now that's in the road. Like, everywhere I go, with this junior hockey, NHL, MLB, ECHL, I'm collecting up dry fits. So, I got this one in exchange for a couple of ties. I don't even know which ones you grabbed. Riles, well, even if I, you still I grabbed have the them. ones that were going to go best with my suit when we were up playing against the Brampton Beast. I was like, I'm going live with this thing next game. Right. Uh, right. I think it. I think your your one tie is undefeated. I only wear it. I got Ooh. big nights. You can't wear the same tie every night. You know, I like to have a little good ro- rotation going. So I've got an undefeated tie going out there. Yeah, I'm not giving it back either. So let Sportsnet know that. <laughs> no worry, you're not getting this dry fit back either. I'm glad, but I just I worked out in it this morning. I'm like, well, I got to put my Mariner shirt on. This after hockey center, just went and grabbed it, and I'm like, ooh, this is uh, this one's pretty ripe. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. Sure oh, you were in there talking to Jim, huh? Yeah, talking to Jim. Yeah, gymnasium, yeah. good buddy of yeah. mine. <laughs> got to got to fit into these suits, man. So, Jeff, you want to give out your home address and people can just send you a bunch of dry fits? Yeah, uh, 1234 Shangri La Lane. Make out any email to T Booth Ferry. Go ahead, send it, send it my way. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, we appreciate, we appreciate you joining us, Jeff. And uh, for everybody watching out there, as always, we're interactive here on X's and O's. So, drop your questions and comments. We've got Jeff for about a half an hour here. We're going to break down everything we've seen in the Stanley Cup playoffs here. I was hoping there wouldn't be any series already wrapped up by the time we jumped on but a couple uh, didn't follow the script and we had a couple of, of sweeps but uh we'll get to that shortly uh, also yep. make sure you share the stream with your friends help us widen our audience we'll be giving away prizes throughout the show we've got trivia coming up a little bit later on jeff for our american audience that does not have access to Sportsnet, i, I think yep. maybe some people up in northern maine might be able to get it but uh, for, for most of the, the viewing, viewing audience that maybe not familiar with you or what you do, mm-hmm. you just give us a quick background. Uh, mainly a bingo caller, uh, work weekends. <laughs> used to, no. So I've been uh, a host for, uh, for, the, uh, for uh, uh, Hockey on Sportsnet now, going back to 2012. Before that, worked at Hockey Night in Canada. Before that, was doing uh, local hockey radio shows in Toronto. So I host a national game on Wednesdays. Uh, I'll host our NHL draft. I'll host free agent day, other events. I'll do hockey central TV uh, at night, um, host Memorial cup, uh, which is a real uh, passion of mine as, as Riles knows. So I'm kind of, it's always been a strategy kills that I've always tried to be able to do as many things as possible. So I host the radio show for Sportsnet every single day. I do the podcast with Elliot Friedman, 31 thoughts. As far as, um, 
protecting oneself in the business, I find if you do a lot of different things, it makes it difficult for them to fire you because it affects too many, <laughs> too many different departments. Like, oh man, we got to move off from Merrick, man. He's like, yeah, but you know what? The radio and digital and uh, just caused too many, too many headaches. So, so far I've been able to dodge the pink paper on the fax machine. I think it's <laughs> not because of anything I'm doing right, Keels, but mainly because uh, it would affect too many departments if they tried to get rid of me. How's that? That's always the number one piece of advice uh, <laughs> in broadcasting, but I think in any, in any occupation, occupation wear as many hats as you can become yeah. as valuable as you can and you'll stick around right and you know what i i learned really early and this is true of, of any career your 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 job begins when the elevator doors open like we tend to think of okay we're only really at work when we're on the air or when the game is on or when we're practicing no man as soon as those elevator doors open like this is one thing that i always tell young broadcasters as well Every relationship you have, every conversation, every email exchange, every text exchange, every follow-up text that you send to people, every conversation, all of it, that is all part of your job. Just because you don't realize it or don't want it to be, every tweet, you know, everything you put up, every reaction that you have on Twitter, et cetera, that's all part of your job because that all goes into how people relate to you. Um, not just your viewers or listeners, but also your colleagues and your bosses as well. Some of the best advice I ever got, and I got it early in my career and never forgot it. So, Jeff, I, I felt, uh, for, first of all, your 31 thoughts, great podcast. Great. It's working for 11A, Riles. You got that right. But also <laughs> your other one you had, Hockey Central at Noon, yeah, um, and another great show. I think that was on in every single hockey locker room that was a good one. North America, Canada, where, where so you go. We'll, yeah, we'll try. That's to on that, there. We'll try to get that one. Like that show still continues. Like, it's primarily just a radio show that's, that's simulcast on NHL Network. And when COVID started, and we all started doing the radio show remotely, we stopped doing it on television because we're not all set up to do it um, to 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 do to do it for TV. So I would think eventually, when we all get back to studio, we would do it again. But nice. I always I always love doing Hockey Central just for that reason, and I'll tell you why. Is because, you know, as Keels just mentioned, primarily I do all of my work in Canada and as known as I might be to a Canadian audience, I don't get a chance to talk to Americans. And when I would do yeah. Hockey Central, that would be go that would go through the States. That would be an opportunity to talk to Americans. More than half my family live in the United States. Um, you know, I used to spend my summers in Livonia, Michigan, where a lot of my family is from and still live. Now they're all scattered. We got Texas, we got Illinois, Pennsylvania, they're all over. Uh, the United States right now, but I've always, always looked for vehicles where I can talk to a U.S. audience. Talking to a Canadian audience is something that I've just done my entire career. Um, I'm always looking for opportunities to to talk to Americans, and and then also talking to like you know a, 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 almost a dual citizen within uh, my brother Colby. What was it like when he first came to the world, and then was... being able to work with him? I, first of all, I love Colbs going back to when he played Red Deer. He was one of my favorite players on that Rebel squad. I love them in the uh, in the NHL. Uh, there are some guys, like in, in this profession, Keels will tell you, there are some guys that are your go-to guys. And you guys have this on the Mariners, right? Like after a game, intermission. Like you ever notice that some of the same faces tend to pop up? It's because these guys are, are great to work with, give you great headlines, give you something thoughtful, just – don't give you the, uh, you know, 110%. All the answers are in that room. Yeah. With the <laughs> kind of like, there are just some guys that you just love talking to. And Colby was always that guy, whether he was playing on the Penguins, whether he was playing on the Thrashers, the Leafs, the Habs, wherever Colby was playing, he was a go-to guy for media because he just seemed so comfortable. He, uh, he had fun. I'm like, you can just tell some guys that when their career is done, they're going to make the transition uh, in the, you know, in, in front of the camera pretty seamlessly. And Colby was that guy. And the one thing that impressed me about Colby right away, he was, well, first of all, like, you know, this about your brother, like the guy is a charming MF or like, holy <laughs> smokes. Like he is so freaking charming. Like everywhere he goes, you know, I've been on the road with him doing Memorial Cups all over the country. I've traveled them for top prospects games all over the country. I've been with your brother traveling, going to different hockey markets a lot, Riles. And everywhere he goes, people 
love him. He is, he has something on television that is the hardest thing to get and the hardest thing to achieve. And that's a connection. I don't do it that great. Ron McLean is the best at it. The minute the camera shows up on your one shot, you connect with the audience. It's a something you do with your face. It's an inflection of your uh, voice. It's Colby can do that with his face. That's do, what I, I know, right? With with <laughs> with that honk, and he's still able to do it. He is charming, and he smiles, and he doesn't take himself seriously. He's so smart. He doesn't even understand like how smart he is. Which actually probably makes him pretty dumb. So that's not really much yeah. of a compliment. Yeah, pretty but dumb. He 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 creates a connection with everybody around him and his either his listeners or his viewers. That that's one of those things that you look at Riles and you say, you either have it or you don't. Like kills, you know what I'm talking about, right? How hard is it I to do. connect to an audience? It's tough because one, you got to be comfortable in your own skin. And that's one thing I'll say about Colby. As much as sometimes he always says, Oh, I'm so nervous, I don't know what to do, and I don't know what to say, and he gets in his own head sometimes. Yep. The minute the light goes on and it's showtime, that guy snaps and he gets into it and it's an instant connection. It's so hard to do in our industry. It's so hard and he's got it naturally and I hate him for it. Tell him I said <laughs> well, that. well, uh, thanks for pumping his tires. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as uh, as Jeff alluded to earlier, I think um, I think Colby's got enough time on uh, X's and O's now. So let's transition <laughs> into yeah. the Stanley Cup playoffs. Well, since we sure. only have Jeff for a limited amount of time and I uh, just wanted to run through each division here and and kind of break things down and what we've seen. And we'll start in the north where I know you guys are focusing yeah. um, a lot of energy there in Sportsnet. One series that is uh, over already, and I think a shocker. Um, yeah, Winnipeg. I mean, just uh, just all the firepower Edmonton had this year. The Connor McDavid story of over a hundred points in fifty six games. Yeah, um, it's pretty amazing that Winnipeg was able to sweep this series. Um, that one nothing game in game two. If you told me there was going to be a one nothing game in this series, I would have called right? you crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, this is going to be viewed as a disappointment uh, for Connor McDavid after the year he had one goal, I believe, in the entire series. Um, what think, happened here, Jeff? A, a, a few things. I think one, uh, I think what this is showing us is that. If you're going to have any long-term success with the Edmonton Oilers, you can't just load up on first line. You're going to have to separate McDavid and Drysaddle because if you put the two of them together, as much as you might say, hey, that's a guarantee, two, three goals a game, it really exposes your lack of depth down the lineup. And we saw that. Um, I don't want to pin anything here on Mike Smith because Mike Smith had a really good season for the Edmonton Oilers. Mike Smith won a lot of games for the Oilers, and he was their, he was their second choice. Their first cho choice was Jacob Markstrom. Uh, Calgary came in at the last minute, either either offered more money or one extra year. I haven't been able to get a definite on what it was that Calgary that put Calgary mm -hmm. over the top, but they ended up getting marks from not Edmonton. And that's when they went back to Mike Smith. Well, Mike Smith gave him some good goaltending this season, but goaltending is still an issue there. Um, I still can't figure out what Dave Tippett was doing by way of roster construction for game four, game three, he made some tweaks and it became more about speed uh, and skill and they dominated Winnipeg, albeit they lost that game. I get that. But up until the 10 point mark, when Archibald takes that penalty on Logan Stanley, Otto uh, Edmonton is dominating that game, completely owning the Winnipeg Jets. And then in a way they went away from that uh, in, in game four, when you look at who, Tippett ended up putting on the ice. Um, it's a it's a shock. It's a disappointment. I just hope for the Oilers' sake and for their fans' sake and for Connor McDavid's sake, where he's got to be getting so frustrated, they start to have some honest conversations here and stop going the safe route. It seems like the Oilers have this Ferrari, but they're playing everything safe around it. Dave Tippett as a hire is a very safe hire. You can justify it simple. Look at the track record. Look at veteran experience. It's a very safe choice. Ditto for Ken Holland as general manager. That is a very safe choice. I think when you have players like Dreisaitl and players like Connor McDavid, you have to take some chances around it. Because if you play it too safe and conservative around these guys, you get what you're getting now with the Edmonton Oilers. I think they, I think they address the net mining issue by going to either Arizona or Columbus. I can see Darcy Kemper in Edmonton. I can see Corpusalo or Merz Lickens in Edmonton as well. I think one of those two teams provides Edmonton with their next goaltender. 
after that, there's going to have to be some pretty blunt and honest conversations in that organization. And just for the sake of uh, squeezing everything in, let's I'll have Riley. Quicker. Let's have <laughs> no. Let's have Riley comment on Toronto, Montreal, and then we'll move on. So, Riles, uh, obviously, only three games have been played so far here, but uh, it's been a pretty competitive series. It is. Um, I, I honestly do feel uh, that Montreal is going to come back in uh, this series and, and take it. That's my uh, opinion on that. I do feel that once you get into playoff hockey, like you see with uh, the Jets and the Oilers, it's a different beast. And um, I, I do feel the Habs uh, back end is pretty solid back there. They have six pretty good defensemen, all big head shutdown guys. And, you know, for the amount of firepower that Toronto has in, in game two, they score five. But uh, Montreal with Carey Price, if he stays on his game and th that uh, decor continues to hold their fort there, um, I think they can limit Marner, Matthews, Spezza, Thornton, even though they're both getting pretty old. But, you know, those guys that can still put up numbers uh, down on the goal area there. And like you saw, I think in the bubble there, Montreal played Pittsburgh. And if they capitalize when when they can, you know, I think they can be pretty dangerous. And we'll see if Montreal can even up the series tonight in game Hot four. Take Tuesday guy, hey? Habs <laughs> <laughs> over Leafs. Hot take Tuesday. I like that. Yep, you're on the record now. All right, moving along to the Mass Mutual East Division, where once again we have one series that has been wrapped up. After losing game one, Boston wins four in a row. First three series, first three games of the series going to overtime, including a double overtime thriller. But guys, in the end, I felt um, I wasn't surprised by this. I felt Boston had the stronger goaltending um, and kind of maybe built better for the playoffs. Uh, and they they looked really, really good. Losing Vanacek stunk. That was that was tough for the Capitals. I picked Boston in this one. Uh, if it weren't for the last few weeks of the season for Washington, I probably would have gone Capitals. I liked them pretty much. Uh, all season, even though there were some some speed wobbles along the way. I just hated the way their season ended, the regular season, that is. Um, it seems like they're at the end of the rope with Yevgeny Kuznetsov, but it's four more years, $7.8 million. Um, there was a lot of frustration there with Ilya Samsonov this year as well with, with various COVID-related COVID, uh, COVID -related mm -hmm. issues. Uh, I know that they're trying to figure out a way to minimize the damage now with the expansion draft. Uh, we'll see what happens with the next Alex Ovechkin contract. I don't think there's any question that he's going to stay. I think it's only where the decimal point is going to be uh, <laughs> when he signs his contract. And and even more so, like, is there enough money you can pay Alex Ovechkin? Because to me, he's one of those guys that has increased the value of your franchise so much that even if you pay him the max amount, which is 20% of the salary cap, that's the max allowed in the CBA, it's still not enough. When you look at how much more valuable the Washington Capitals have become since Ovechkin was there, like that, don't we all tend to forget? Now Washington was bad. They were, they were so far off the sports radar in North America, it wasn't funny. And he helped reestablish that brand, that identity, that organization. No matter what you pay the guy, it's not going to be enough. The Chara questions will linger. He said he's going to take a couple of days, talk to his family, and figure out what's uh, what he wants to do, but. You know, this is a few seasons in a row with first round exits for the Washington Capitals. We talked about tough questions for the Oilers. They're going to have to have some blunt ones in Washington about where does this team go next now? Riles, I'm sure you've been speaking a lot with Colby about Pittsburgh. They find themselves now down in the series uh, after a double overtime. Josh Bailey last night. Uh, this has maybe been the most competitive series of all, which, um, I, again, I'm not surprised by that. I thought the Islanders had a good built for playoffs type team, but they went into the playoffs kind of skittering a little bit. Um, what have you seen in that series? Come on, hot take guy. Yep, hot take guy here. Well, I think uh, Mike Sullivan's right up there for the mix of uh, coach of the year uh, with the roster that he had um, and the goaltending situation that they went into at the start of the season, uh, the Smith and Jari, um, that he – put a team together that won the whole division uh, or got them up for every single game. You look at the guys that were hurt during the course of the season. Dumoulin was out for a big chunk. Malkin out for a big chunk. Both are back now. Um, you know, I think for a couple of costly mistakes by uh, Jari in a couple of the games, you know, I think the series could probably almost be over by now um, in favor of the Penguins. Uh, but again, you know, Jari's still a young kid. I, I think he's still fine his way. Um, I think he's, he can still be a cornerstone for the Penguins in, in years to come. Um, so it'll be in, interesting to kind of see how this one pans out, but they've, they've matched up 
um, in the last couple of years before the bubble, uh, Islanders, Penguins in the playoffs as, as, as well. So um, I anticipate this one going seven, uh, and I think the Penguins take it because Sid just knows how to win. No matter what, he knows what it takes to win. The uh, You know what this year has really proven to me about the Penguins? One, one of the, the eye-openers for me is just how important Brian Dumoul is, Dumoulin is yep. to that organization. Local they, main boy. Local they, main kid. They, they yep. don't win without Dumoulin. That guy, we all love Chris Letang, of course, given, right? Sick flow, yeah. And Brian, he does have the sick flow, too. He's a beast <laughs> in the gym, too. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. But he's, uh, they don't win without Brian Dumoulin. By the way, when you get a chance at the Memorial Cup in Windsor, one of, my f- one of the funniest moments I've ever seen happened between Colby and Matthew Barzal. Now the Islanders, then of the Seattle Thunderbirds. Yeah. Where Barzal, did you ever tell you a story about Barzal was a huge Crosby fan? So we're talking to... Uh, uh, Thunderbirds PR and like, okay, so who do you want to talk to after the first skate? Me and Colby are like, Barzal, are you kidding? Of course. So Barzal, who's a huge Crosby fan, sort of puts up with our stupid questions. You can tell, like honestly, Riles, you can tell that all he wants to do is talk to Colby about what it's <laughs> like playing with Crosby. So I'm standing there like dumb Joe dog while uh, we finish up our interview. And then honestly, it was the funniest thing. Barzal's like, uh, can I ask you about Sidney Crosby? And stood there, like, in, interviewed your brother. That's like 19 year old Matthew Barzal about Sidney Crosby. Was so I'll never forget it. Stand right beside the the visitors' locker room, the WFCU in uh, in Windsor after the first uh, Seattle practice. That's great. That's awesome great. story. That, that, that's what Sid is, though, right? He's an icon to a lot of these young kids. 100. percent The Discover Central Division, the Battle of Florida. Tampa Bay had a three one series lead. Florida stayed alive last night and we'll try to now force it to game seven and in the carolina nashville series i i call this the home ice advantage series because buildings have been rocking uh in in this series and the the home team has won all four uh including some overtime heroics so i don't know what what comes to mind first here jeff but i'll just let you jump in Saros. UC yes. Saros will not get any heart trophy consideration from the majority of uh, uh people who vote for it but by definition of the trophy, player most valuable to his team, when you consider how far Nashville was out of it, when you consider how everybody was talking about David Poyle at trade deadline, moving everybody whose name wasn't Roman Yossi, and we heard all the names, all the names came up. When you consider how far out of it they were and what Roman Yossi was able, and what um, UC Saros was able to do, to bring this team uh, back into a contention and then be a playoff spot. Like I know, I know the teams around them kind of squandered their opportunities, but Saros was the guy that got them into this position where not only did they make the playoffs, but now they're stretching a team that many are looking at and they're saying, you know what? This team could win the Stanley cup. Like you could make the case for Carolina to win the cup and no one would, no one would laugh at you. I don't mm-hmm. think. Um, and to me, Saros by definition of what the heart trophy is, He's got to be right in that conversation and he's carrying it on. And the weird thing about it is it's a five eleven goaltender. Yeah. You know, like if, if you they don't make him like that anymore, they don't like, okay, let's go back. Let's say 30 years. Okay. And you take two hockey players and they're just standing in there like gym shorts and dry fit. Okay. They're standing up against the wall. One of them is six foot five. And one of them is five foot 11. If I said to you 30 years ago, 30 years ago, show me the defenseman and show me the goalie. The six foot five guy was a defenseman. The five eleven guy was a goalie. You fast forward thirty years now, that's flipped. Mm-hmm. The five eleven guy is now your defenseman. The six foot five guy is your goaltender. You see sorrow as much like Kudobin last year. Throwback. Yeah. We don't see goalies that short in the NHL anymore. There's a handful, right? There's like Halak, Saros, Hudobin. I guess Nadelkovich too. So you got two shorter goaltenders going head to head here, but you just don't see them anymore. Berkey would call him a unicorn. He's a unicorn yeah. goalie. We don't see these types of guys anymore. Sorry, Riles, I'm using up all the oxygen here. You no, yeah, hey, Jeff, right. you're 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 <laughs> you are welcome to stay with us as long as you want. So so uh, hey. you just let us know, Riles. Talking what have you seen in the goalies. battle, of Florida? Talking about goalies here, the Shun, Shun, Sunshine State, Spencer Knight. Ooh. Like what a game last night coming in. He lets up that first goal on his first shot yep. in his playoff debut, but. He puts together a pretty solid game, and 
you know, I was uh, thinking to myself last night, um, does this leave the Panthers in a spot where they buy out Bob and take a lot of money off the cap? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just mm. all in because of how he looked. Yeah. Uh, Knight has played in so many game-breaking games this past season at World Juniors, the college level, all that kind of stuff. I think he's uh, he might be like that second wind uh, that the Panthers need here to force a game seven. I thought goaltenders needed 200 games in the minors first. No, nope, not always been the rule. No, not not anymore. Well, at least don't make the jump. You need 200 games. Come on, man, 200 games. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, in the Honda West Division, we had a sweep. Uh, probably not very surprising to most people. Uh, almost everybody I knew had Colorado winning the series. Uh, they looked pretty dominant throughout. And then uh, the Wild staying alive last night, getting the win. Um, and they've been kind of pesky. They stole game one. They've been in just about every game besides maybe game four and um jeff can the wild force game seven of course they can and if you look at how we used to always say this about boxing right styles make fights uh, i've always felt that about uh playoff series as well and even just regular season games as well for uh i know a lot of people um in eastern canada might not stay up to watch vegas play a ton um but every time vegas and minnesota got together this year they were the best games in the nhl like these were the two teams this year that as far as like the mix they both had, like every game was amazing. So I was pretty happy to see these two teams get together uh, early in the playoffs. Um, can they force a game seven? Of course they can. Here's the interesting thing to me about the Minnesota Wild. At the end of all of this, and it, if it ends in the first round, you know, you might look at it and say, well, this is what Minnesota does. They just do enough to get in and then they miss in the first round. But doesn't it feel different now? Like, doesn't mm -hmm. it feel different with the Minnesota Wild? Like, Kirill Kaprizov has changed everything and all the expectations, future, all of it for the Minnesota Wild. Ultimately, it may be the song remains the same for Minnesota if you just look at it like a hockey card stat. Oh, they made it at the playoffs and lost in the first round. But when you sort of peel back on what's happening here with Minnesota, whether it's the emergence of Erickson Eck as a Selkie can Trophy candidate, whether it's, you know, people finally noticing how good Jonas Brodin is um, as a defenseman or how outstanding Karel Kaprizov is and how the fortunes of this team have been changed now for the next 10 years because of his emergence. They may bow out, and I expect them to do it, Keels. Mm -hmm. But there's something different about them bowing out in the first round this time around. No, I, I agree. It feels different. And, and Riley, in that other series, uh, Nathan McKinnon saying, hey, all this talk about Connor McDavid, well, I'm a world-class player as well, and what a performance he put on. Yeah, you know, even though he took out uh, took out a, a Saskatoon kid in Braden Shen that uh, I, I root for every single time he steps on the ice, absolutely love the family. Um, but, uh, you know, another one, when you talk about the coaches is Jared Bednar. He was my assistant coach um, with the Abbotsford Heat in the American Hockey League before he made the jump to be a head guy in the American League to winning a Calder. I think he might uh, be in the mix here to place the Stanley Cup coming up this year if Colorado continues to play like they are. Alumni of the RHI's Anaheim Bullfrogs. I was a huge roller hockey international yeah. fan back in the day, and I love anyone who played in that league, and I'm still fascinated by that league. And Toronto had a team for one season called the Planets, and Dan Dawu was on the team, and Manny Legacy, and Lou Francis skating. I never missed a game, and I never missed going to drink with them at the <laughs> Madison afterwards in downtown Toronto. Um, but, uh, I'm with you hundred percent on Bednar. The one guy that I, that I would mention in that Colorado series, McKinnon gets all the headlines and rightfully so is one of the best players in the world, period. Miko Ratnan gets a whole lot of headlines for the obvious reasons. What a shot that kid is spectacular. I still maintain the reason that line works is Gabriel Landeskog. Gabriel yep. Landeskog, and we'll go back to that fight in game one against uh, your boy Shannon yeah. there. Like it was a real, real good fight. And it was one of those fights where, you know, Landis Gog is throwing and, you know, just, okay, you guys know this. You know, there are just some fights where two guys agree to fight, but they're just kind of going through the motions and then, mm -hmm. okay, someone step on a banana peel so we can end this thing and just, <laughs> we'll just call it a day. But we, we did the hockey thing we were supposed to do at this moment. Every punch that Landis Gog threw had anger in it. Like he is, he's not the best fighter in the NHL. He'll do it. And he's not shy about doing it, but pound for pound. He might be one of the strongest players 
in the NHL. And I was reminded recently of a game, we go back to junior hockey, Kitchener and Sault Ste. Marie. Landis Gog's a rookie with the Rangers, and they're playing against the Greyhounds. And Jake Muzzin, uh, one of the toughest guys in the league at that time, just cleans one of the Rangers right by the bench. And as either the same shift or the next shift, Landis Gog comes out and and starts feeding Muzzin. And everybody's like, first of all, respect. Like, he just went up and took on one of the toughest players in the OHL. And you're, like, near beating the brakes off the guy. Like, this guy has... We always talk about players that just understand it, understand the moment, understand what to do, understand the 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 sense of every single moment. That's Gabriel Landeskog. He's one of my favorite players in the game. Uh, he'll play it any way you want, and I still maintain the reason that McKinnon can go all over the ice, the reason that Rantanen can go all over the ice is the same reason that line works, and it's Gabriel Landeskog. That's why he was my pick for Conn Smythe Trophy winner. So there you go. How's that for my hot take, Ralph? I love hot Jeff, take. That's but, great. <laughs> before before we let you go here, I want to get predictions from you. Okay. On the four teams. I'm bad at this. I'm so bad. The teams bad. that will come out of each I division. I picked Carter Hart for the Vesna Trophy <laughs> this year, Keels. Well, you weren't alone. You weren't alone. That's for sure. I think Danny Breer picked that too. So, uh, so give me give me one team to come out of each division here. Uh, obviously, some have already been eliminated, so you, you, yeah. it's a little easier. And then and then one Stanley Cup champion. Uh man, Colorado Vegas could be really good if we get there. I still like Colorado. Uh, I still like Toronto. Um, sorry, Riles. I know you want your hot take halves on this Tuesday coming through. Right. Carey Price so joining okay. the rush now. Carey Price playing on the power play. What's uh, how, how the Habs? How the Habs going to do this? Well, um, they will just watch. <laughs> you're, probably <right. laughs> you're probably right too, man. I can't. Well, I guess turn my phone off when Montreal beats Toronto. Our fucking Riles texting yeah. again. Great. That is what I need. Um, I really want to say Pittsburgh because I cheer for people more than teams. And and I want to see Berkey do well now that he's back in the game. And I want to see Sidney Crosby do well. And I want Sidney Crosby go deep in the playoffs, but I can't do it. Uh, I'll take Islanders in uh, in in that one. I'm so stuck. I'm it's so a, stuck. Central's I'm, tough. I know. I'm like, do I want to say Tampa? And Florida's really stretching them here. I haven't loved the way Vasilevsky's play, to be honest with you. I know we're focusing on the Florida goaltenders, but uh, <laughs> Tampa's guy here isn't exactly, yeah. you know, the ghost of Jacques Plant and Terry Sawchuk. So let's just calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Carolina. Okay. How about Riles? Riles I, got, me uh, I got hot take Habs coming out. Of, <laughs> um, I got Vegas Bruins and Carolina, and I have Vegas winning the cup. Yeah. Oh, and sorry, Jeff, you're, you're cup champion. I left that out. Sorry about Colorado. that. Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Oh, geez. Well, yeah, I might Colorado. I might end earlier. You might, but like like Gabriel, I said, you Gabriel you Landeskog, MVP, Gabriel Landeskog, MVP. Take it to the bank, long term deposit rivals. <laughs> multi guaranteed. Here we go. Hey, hey, you, you cheer for people and uh Flower has uh been friends with Colby for quite some time. I absolutely love his personality and what he does and how he plays. Yep. I think it would be great for him to lift a cup with Vegas. And I Mark think. Stone. I cheer for him, man. Yeah, 100%. I cheer, I cheer for that dude. Plus your hockey the, league alumni. All the, I know. Here we go. Here we yeah. go. Man, the Wheat Kings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, your, get your Western Hockey League on, Riles. All right. Yeah. Yo, you got that right. Very good. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I, I personally have loved the divisional playoff format this year. I think it's made for some interesting matchups and some p- potential upsets, um, which obviously has already happened in one case with Winnipeg. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Peace out. Uh, we'll have to have you on here again at some point. Absolutely. Anytime you guys call, I'll come on. You just let me know. Whenever you feel like your your audience is too get is getting too excited and you need someone to bore them a little bit, <laughs> you guys just just give me a call. I can Love I can it. dull I can dull down any conversation. Love it. And uh, I'll be sending you a new uh, shirt there. For this is this is vintage now, and I'm telling that you, that is vintage. Really, I'll, really I'll does, toss you up a new one. We got some really, new stuff. It really yeah, does not smell good, man. I'm <laughs> Get it in the wash. Peace All out, right, boys. Jeff. Have a good thank, one. Thank you. Have a good thank one. Thank you, Jeff. So Riley and I will stick on here and uh, talk a little bit more here. We don't want to. We don't want to short to all of our viewers a half hour. And just a reminder to all of our viewers: um, make sure you're sharing the stream. We're going to have uh, trivia coming up in here in a moment for uh, for a prize. And then also interact, drop some comments and questions, and we'll bring those up on screen. That was a lot of fun. I wish, Riles, we had some more time with Jeff. But 
um, uh, that was great. I mean, I think I think um, Colby uh, has some competition now as far as best guests we've had. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, going back to our first one, I thought John Snowden was pretty good as well uh, <laughs> with his insights. So having a couple of professional media people, um, you know, it's kind of hard to hold the hold the candle to. I know my uh, my wife here wants Jeff back on too. So. <laughs> Uh, Are you counting hopefully. me as a professional media person or no? I am. I okay. Am. All so right. So three. Are, yeah, you've been doing this for a while now, <laughs> and uh, you have uh, the, the the way you host the show is uh, second to none. Appreciate that. Uh, let's get to our trivia here, real quick. Uh, give some some time for the viewers out there to stew on it. Which playoff team? Uh, and this is including the teams that have been eliminated had the most ECHL alumni to make their NHL debut. So former ECHL players that made their debuts for in the NHL this year. Uh, in fact, I will give a hint. It, 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 there were three players for this particular team that made their NHL debut. So uh, drop your best guesses in the comments. The winner today will get a Mariners backpack. So you can hold lots of cool stuff in there and or uh, for, for back to school in the fall. Uh, hopefully everyone will be back to school in person. Um, you can have a backpack for, for your son or daughter. Okay, Riles, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to it uh, with Jeff, but I want to go through some NHL awards here. Uh, starting with the Hart Trophy for the league's MVP. Many people would say uh, this one is going to be a runaway unanimous decision for Connor McDavid. What say you? I got Nathan McKinnon. Uh, okay. You know, I, I, I do feel... Um, you know, I, you can't take away a hundred points is a hundred points. Um, but the way that McKinnon has played this year, um, you know, I think he's just a standout down in Colorado. I, I do feel that McDavid probably gets a lot more hype, uh, being with the Oilers and being in Canada, uh, than McKinnon has. And I think you can see that, uh, based off hockey markets, uh, you look at Jonathan who Huberdeau. Uh, down in Florida, you know, no, no one really talks about him as well. And I think it's because he's in Florida. If you put him up in Montreal, I think he is, um, you know, one of the hot, like a hot topic throughout the whole league, just in the market he's in. So I think a guy like McKinnon gets overlooked, but uh, that's my pick. Yeah. And I think, I mean, he, he is clearly trying to make a statement by what he's doing uh, in the playoffs so far. And, um, you know, it, he, he has been a, top three player in this league for years now. And he does go under the radar. And it's funny because when Colorado was in their heyday and they had Joe Sackett and Peter Forsberg and Patrick Waugh, they were a mainstream team, but they haven't been able to get back to that status. But McKinnon, I think, is is dragging them there along with the other players that Jeff mentioned. Um, yeah, one, over one, that series. 100%, 100% on that. Moving on to the Vesna for the top goaltender. Who do you have there? I got Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, at uh, 36 years old, I'm still bringing it. Uh, um, you know, I tried doing the splits the other day, and uh, trust me, my hips uh, weren't loving. <laughs> so with Flurry still doing what he's doing, the saves that he's making, um, and just how Vegas is playing. You look at the playoffs right now, and I know these stats and these things don't have anything to do with the playoffs, but him moving up the charts and – all-time shutouts, all-time wins for playoffs. Uh, even I think he's third all-time wins for goalies during the regular season, you know, behind uh, two greats as well, you know, and Martin Broder and Patrick Waugh. Like, you know, I think uh, with what he's done this year, um, what Vegas has done this year, I think uh, that's that's my pick for the Vesna. Uh, Vasilevsky also having a good year for uh, – or had a good year for Tampa Bay. UC Soros, as Jeff mentioned, for Nashville. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Flurry. Uh, yeah, every time with each and every year that goes on, I think to myself, okay, Flurry is going to start declining, uh, and it really hasn't happened. But but if you think about it, goaltenders have proven to uh, really be productive into their forties. Even Mike Smith, again, a guy that Jeff mentioned, um, Craig Anderson, even though he wasn't a, a starting goalie this year, he played really well in Game One. I know we talked about that yesterday off the air, Riles. Uh, and Ryan Miller, who just announced his retirement, was pretty pretty effective goaltender uh, into his, his his later years. So goalies can hang on. Uh, I mean, we've seen it. Uh, there's others too that I'm that I'm not even thinking of um, that have been around. I mean, how long has Tuka Rask been around? I mean, he, I don't think he's up there in age yet, but I don't see him. He hasn't really shown a decline. And if, if anything, no. he's gotten better. 
um, as, as it's gone on. So, yeah, no, uh, I totally agree. Calder trophy for rookie of the year. Uh, again, I think you, you're going to, most people are going to say Kapil, K, uh, Kirill Kaprizov. However, I hear you're going another direction. I'm going with Robertson out of the Dallas stars. Um, I just think, you know, a, a guy in a market that no one talked about, I think Kaprizov, um, you know, definitely put the Minnesota wild back on the map this year. Kind of like what Jeff mentioned, how he's turned the ship right there, um, for the wild. But I think, uh, down in Dallas, when you look, you got Jamie Ben and Sagan, um, you know, and I think now Rob Robertson coming in, um, you know, and he's surrounded by some pretty good leaders like those two. And also Joe Pavelski, I think, um, I think he, uh, I think he's going to take home the Calder and, now you see him over there and he's playing in the uh, world championship for team USA and he's put on a clinic there too. So he hasn't stopped. Um, so lo looking out of big things for him. Sam trying to match your level of hot takes, Riley with, uh, I like that. I'll for, take that. Hot Jeremy take. Swayman I'll take that. Yeah. Next, next year. Um, so we'll see, we'll see if the, that comes to fruition, Sam, you're now on the record, so you can take credit if that happens. Uh, Norris, the Norris trophy for a top defenseman who you have Riles. Um, I got Kale McCarr. Um, I just think he's uh, he's a, he's kind of does it all. Um, scores goals when you need it. The way he moves um, all all over the rink in the defensive zone, jumping up, uh, the offensive zone, walking the blue line, getting his shots through, and then how he just shuts down guys. Uh, plus player as as a defenseman, uh, continually just puts up points. And um, you know, I think it's kind of him and. Uh, uh, Hughes out of Vancouver that were kind of in the running there. Uh, but I think he's going to take it. Adam Fox of the Rangers as well. No relation to Dylan Fox, although that gets conf a lot of people uh, confuse that. But no I, relation I, at all. Yeah. I think Dylan, um, he just runs with it and just takes oh, it in stride. 100% one, one he <laughs> runs with that. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Adams, I know you pay a lot of attention to this as a head coach yourself. Lots of good candidates this year. Who do you have? I have I have two, and I've gone back and forth. I mentioned them earlier: Mike Sullivan and Jared Bednar. Um, I think Sullivan might be uh, a little just ahead of him because of what the Penguins went through this year, and how he put a team out on the ice to win a, a, a division. I think that takes a lot uh, with the amount of times they played in in division. Uh, when you're seeing seeing the same teams over and over again, it's hard to continuously put up wins. Um, and then just with Bednar, um, he used to coach me and I've kind of followed along. He started, uh, with the South Carolina Stingrays in the ECHL as an assistant as a head, uh, moved up into the American league. That's where I had him in Ab Abbotsford. And from there he went on to be a head coach in the American league and now up in Colorado. So, um, always watching him and his progress as well. And he's a fellow, uh, Saskatchewan. Guy too, so, and I, fun. I, I'd like to throw out Rod Brindamore as well. Um, I mean, you look at their roster outside of Sebastian Ajo, nobody really jumps off the page as a uh, superstar player. And I think they're kind of the true definition of a team um, that has turned into you know, a division winner. And most people were not picking them to win that division. So, um, and I think, you know, I think if you did a, a four year award for coach of the year, mm -hmm. it'd be Rod the Bod. Um, no question. He's definitely turned that team around um, coming in there after taking over and uh, has done great, great things. Um, I think uh, they've left them in a good spot with the prospects that Ron Francis had uh, put in place. So hopefully, um, you know, I, I'd love to see Carolina continue to push through in that division as well. We're going to transition on to um, some ECHL talk here, which will be the final topic of the show. But before we do, um, one more time with the trivia question to give you a chance to think about it, which playoff team this year's NHL playoffs had the most ECHL alumni to make their NHL debuts this season. So again, uh, an NHL team that had the most former ECHL players make their NHL debut this year. And uh, since we haven't any guesses yet, I'll give, I'll, I'll give another hint out the team. The answer is a team that is still alive uh, in the playoffs to this point. So, you know, we've been a little disconnected from the ECHL uh, this season, obviously, without uh, the Mariners or the North Division participating. But um, there are 14 teams playing and wrapping up the season. 
with uh, two conferences this year, top four teams by point percentage will qualify. So um, the reason for that, obviously, some games have been postponed and will probably be canceled altogether for COVID reasons. Also, Fort Wayne playing just a 50-game season. They started in February, where the rest of the league started in December. Uh, but some teams will get 72 games in, which is quite an accomplishment. The ECHL should be commended for that, um, doing a great job this year. Some uh, Mariners players scattered throughout um, and some good races here. Riles, I think the place to start is with the Florida Everblades. I believe at the beginning of the season, we talked about some of the teams that you thought would be um, con- you know, the, the winners. And I think you mentioned Florida. Of course, Alex Kyle is down there having a great year. Uh, and the Everblades have clinched a playoff spot, one of three teams that have clinched a playoff spot. Um, I don't know how much you've watched or kept in contact with our players, but um, what are your thoughts on on uh, Florida? Yeah, um, you know, they've had a good year right, right from the start. Um, you know, they went on a run uh, right right from the opening gate of the season. Um, but I think the the key point here is that when you're doing it by winning percentage, it's not so much, you know, like it's even just getting those wins in overtime, they mean even more. Um, And, and I think when, when you look at it after with Florida clinching there uh, with the other five teams from Greenville down to Jacksonville, that's still a a pretty tight race. And the tightest is that four five, six spot. uh, When you look at the winning percentage from 56 to 53, and all the same uh, amount of games. I don't know if any of those teams lost any games due to COVID or where their schedule is going to end. But if they continue to go on to play a 72-game season with eight more games remaining, I think that one's going to come right down to the wire. Um, Orlando made some really big moves, uh, bringing in Jolie at the trade deadline from Wheeling to add to their scoring punch. Um, so that's going to be really in- interesting to kind of see what happens there. Uh, Jacksonville has Michael Kim uh, that we signed at the start of last season, who's put up some pretty good points there that, um, you know, I think uh, if Jason Christie can get them going here in the final eight, that they can push it into that fourth spot. So um, I think uh, the the start that Indy had to the year with them in Florida, they were kind of going back and forth on that one, two spot. So I think the biggest surprise for me in that East division has been Greenville. Um, they've really uh, have, made a strong push here in the last little bit um, since the trade deadline and uh, racking up some wins. And I am glad looking at this, I do not have to try to calculate magic numbers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this season. It's hard enough to do it by points, but I don't even know how I would do it by point percentage, not knowing uh, teams having an e- uneven amount of games remaining. Um, so uh, God bless uh, the other broadcasters uh, throughout the league trying to figure out magic numbers and whatnot. <laughs> it, it may come down to the final day. Uh, in fact, almost certainly will for some of these teams. Uh, we got Michael McNicholas playing in Tulsa. Looks like they are they only have four games left, and they're about 80 percentage or 0. 0.8, 0.08 percentage points out. So that's going to be it's going to be tough. But, um, you know, M- Michael's had a heck of a year. He's played on three different teams. Um, and hopefully we'll have him back here next year. But um, what do you see in the West? Yeah, uh, I honestly did not think Wichita would be where they are. Um, I thought uh, I, I still kind of think about it with Fort Wayne coming in a little late. They've played a lot of games in a short amount of time, though. Uh, but they came flying out of the gates. Uh, ben Boudreau did a good job in recruiting a team to start in February. Um, Allen had a good team right off the bat. Um, and then, you know, when, when you look at the other guys, I kind of thought Utah would be up there a little further, uh, pushing that one or two spot, not necessarily back where they are. Um, and that winning percentage, uh, they've had a lot of guys that were up and down through Colorado Eagles and with their American league team as well this year. So, you know, I think when you have that flux of, uh, players in and out, like they've had, it makes it a little bit harder. Um, and then, you know, I think with with uh, Tulsa and, and Kansas City, Kansas City that uh, Tato had had uh, his first run uh, this year as a head guy and during difficult times. He's trying to put his own uh, twist on his team and, and you know, probably move some guys to get his guys in. So it'll be def- definitely in- interesting to kind of see what next year brings with them. But um, I still think Tulsa can make a good push. Um, I like Nikki as a player. Um He's been on three teams. 
Uh, but at the same time, during this type of year with players being traded or sent down or players just coming available out of nowhere that want to come and play, he's kind of been the odd odd man out. And I I think there there comes a pattern with that because his rights come back to Maine at the end of the season. So why would a team want to hold on to Nicky or other players like that when they know I could get this player in, I have his rights for next year, and – Michael McNicholas is just an easy guy to move and which, which I completely get when that stuff happens. So, um, but I, I hope that he continues to have a, a strong uh, final four games here, make a push. I'd love to see him play in the playoffs just to gain that experience um, when he comes uh, back here next year. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure he'll appreciate the stability of, <laughs> of being in one place uh, next year after this world one season for him. Um, the regular season will wrap up in the first week of June and then they'll, they will make a, a mad dash through the playoffs with five game series this year, best of fives, and they will award the Kelly Cup by, I believe, July 7th is the date around there. So uh, check that out on Flow Sports if you haven't. That They'll be our provider for all the Mariners broadcasts going into next season. They, they've done a great job uh, this year uh, as well for the 14 teams that have played. So that will just about wrap it up here. Uh, just wanted to make one more uh, note. If you missed it, we released the schedule last week. In fact, you can watch Ryle and I break down the schedule, uh, or not last week, two weeks ago, on the two weeks ago episode of X's and O's. Uh, you can check out the schedule at marinersofmaine.com slash schedule. Ticket package is now on sale. Individual game tickets will go on sale in September, but you can get your full season, half season, 10 ticket flex plans, and 12 game mini plans. Call us uh, at 833 go Maine. You can also get the information on the website. Uh, and if you go into the media tab, you can watch the archives of all the X's and O's episodes, including uh, last week or last show when we broke down broke down the schedule. Riley, ten episodes in, this has been fun. It it went by fast. Um, we want to give a big thank you to all of our guests that we've had so far, all the coaches around the North Division: Colby Armstrong, Jeff Merrick, Austin Violette, um, Johnny McKinnis, all the guests we have had. Uh, and we're going to now move to uh, we're going to shoot for once a month now over the next couple of months just to space it out a little bit more, but we'll continue to be here and uh, get, maybe we'll get back to uh, some more behind the scenes uh, film for the, for the next episode. But uh, what do you think? 10 episodes in, this is a, uh, it's been good. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I think we could have a little breather here and, uh, and have Colby and Jeff Merrick on talking. Oh man. Oh, we might need you know to, we might need to cut out two hours for that though. <laughs> you know, I, I think it'd be cool to do a, a, a free agent day um, after the free agent frenzy, yeah. what players are going where. I think that'd be a great uh, inside scoop with those two guys on, on here getting a little uh, in depth on some rosters. Um, and I also want to maybe uh, over the course of the summer, tap back into some more North uh, division coaches as the schedule has been released on, teams that we will be seeing a lot more um, coming in, in into the picture. And uh, with uh, Trois Riviere, uh, hopefully sometime soon announcing a coach that uh, maybe have him on too to kind of pick uh, his brain on a new team coming into the league. That'll be fun. We definitely should aim to do that. Uh, we did not have a correct answer to our trivia question. The answer was the Nashville Predators, Frederick yeah. Allard, Tanner Janot, and Cole Smith. All ECHL alumni, um, and a, at least two of the three have played, if not all three, in this playoff series um, uh, between Nashville and Carolina. So that's a cool tidbit for the ECHL, continuing to move players up the ladder uh, as as uh, they have done so really successfully, particularly over the last couple of years. Thanks to everybody that's tuned in uh, throughout the first 10 episodes of X's and O's and helped make it a success. And again, we will be in touch on our social media with the date and guest for our next episode. Riley, thanks as always for being here. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Gills. And thanks again to Jeff Merrick for jumping on for the first half hour. Michael Keeley signing off. Hope everyone has a great day, a great week, and we'll talk to you later.